You're listening to The Stark Truth with Robert Stark. This is Robert Stark. I am joined here with uh, Richard Spencer. Uh, We're going to be discussing uh, Richard's experience at the Republican uh, National Convention. Uh, Richard, uh, great having you on. Well, thanks for having me back. It's good to be here. And I'm also uh, joined here with uh, Alex von Goldstein. It's a pleasure to be speaking with you guys tonight. Richard, you were at the convention. Were you inside where the speeches were? Or were you outside in the public square? Uh, both. I, I was. I, I was able to get into uh, Quicken Loans Arena, Arena, or the Q, as it was is called, and uh, so I was there, which gives you a, a definitely a, a different perspective and a very valuable one. Um, but I was also outside, of course. So I, I was kind of on the whole time. That's what I was saying just before you started. Um, I am truly exhausted. Uh, I think I'm going to have to just sleep and relax for a, a couple of days. I've told myself not to drink alcohol for a week because when you're ever <laughs> when you're at these things that are all about schmoozing, uh, it, it, it was uh, one bourbon fueled haze of a of a weekend. <laughs> You got to meet a lot of people, right? I saw a picture of you and Roger Stone. Yeah, yeah. You know, I just ran into Roger Stone. I mean, that that's the kind of thing that's so great about these. And, and I think that we should descend on some of these events, like as the alt-right or, or whatever you want to uh, call yourself. Uh, and, and because it's just like we're all together in this square mind, basically. And so you run into people that you probably wouldn't have, uh, you know, an opportunity to meet. Um, I spent an hour with Jorge Rama. <laughs> which was How did that go? Oh, what is happened? that about the HBO documentary? Yeah, yeah. Well, a- HBO is doing this documentary, and I don't fully even know what it's going to be about. I actually don't think the, the filmmakers know. Uh, the filmmaker is a very genuine woman um, named Catherine, and um, I really actually enjoyed talking with her. Um, I, I don't think this is going to be some Daily Show style thing where you know they edit it, they edit everything in a way that you know they, they make you say the the exact opposite of what you said, and it's it's just this really disingenuous you know um, hatchet job. I don't think she wants to do that, and it, the, the documentary is also not about me. Um, although I'm, I'm kind of in it. Uh, she, they've been to Orlando. They went to Dallas, Texas. They uh, Orlando right after the, the shooting. So I think, you know, it's on Trump and I guess Trump and race in America and things like that. But or maybe something like think, extremism in America. That might be what it is. Um, I don't think I'm going to come off as an extremist. Uh, but uh, very interesting things. Like we, we, you know, through her, I talked to Jorge Ramos and uh, so we just walked around the center of, uh, it was called Public Square, which is this actually beautiful part of downtown Cleveland. Just as an aside, I have to say, uh, Cleveland exceeded my expectations. I mean, granted, my expectations were very low, because uh, <laughs> I'd never been there, and uh, you know, I just kind of heard, you know, Cleveland, it's, you know, it's terrible kind of things. But actually, it's, it's a really great place. Um, I, I really enjoyed it. They've, like really built up downtown um, uh, there, there you do see the kind of Detroit style you know abandoned factories that uh, are, are you know kind of scary maybe gothically interesting kind of things but and, and there's obviously huge ghettos and so on but uh, I was definitely you know pleasantly surprised by Cleveland but anyway they, they've just redone this public square and I think they even finished it a week before the convention and so it's a really cool place. It's a big Civil War memorial. And 
So Jorge Ramos and I just kind of walked around, um, and uh, I, 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 I definitely engaged him. We and you know a couple of sparks flew, but I, I didn't really think it was the time. It, I was not. It was not good to attack him at that point. I, I was trying to always find common ground and seeing if he could agree with me, and we actually could agree. With him. Um, and Were I was you able asking, to find a correlation, like on identitarian issues, because I know like, Fernando yeah. Cortez spoke at um, Amran, and you asked a question. Uh, you were the first person to ask a question in the Q and A part. So I think I think it's kind of cool to see identitarians of like you know different ethnic groups uh, talk with one another. Exactly. That's exactly what I was trying to do. I I didn't. I, you know, the worst thing I could do is be like, you know, you're an illegal immigrant. Get out. You know, kind of thing. <laughs> What's, what's funny about Jorge Ramos is that he's basically as white as we are. So maybe the yeah. le, the the cultural Marxists are right when they say race is just a social con- construct. <laughs> you know, I I mentioned these things. Um, I, uh, I I said you know in the in the eyes of many people Latin American, you, you are effectively white. Um, I mean, his eyes were bluer than mine, so he. Um, you know, he, he, he could definitely, you know, he looks, he looks like an Italian or a, a Spaniard or something. People who are, who we would definitely consider to be European. Um, and well, how did he yeah. respond to that? And you said uh, Marco Rubio was effectively white to that Antifa guy. <laughs> sure. It was on YouTube. He agreed. Yeah, he agreed. And, and actually, I would say this. I also agree that race is not everything in terms of identity. You know, I mean, it's an indispensable component. But it's not everything. It's just a it's a it's a big thing. But you know, also history and language and religion and culture and and experience are of course you know indispensable as well. Uh, so, but yeah, we talked about that. I mean, I think at one point he said, "I admire your courage. I, I admire and respect you." And you know, I, I you kind of I think I did the right thing, and that is to find common ground and to not get into a shouting fest. Maybe that's what some people would want to do, or that's what they want to see. It's, you know, I don't know if you've seen that video of uh, Alex Jones on the Pierce Morgan program or something, where he was just another, 76 will commence again. Yeah, or the <laughs> one about Ann, that. There's the interview with uh, Ann Coulter and Jorge Ramos. Right, I've seen that. Um, the shit learning about, kind of. Yeah, you know, look, there's, there's times to get a little edgy. Um, I, I can get I can get a little edgy when someone is I, I don't know it, it's kind of like you play tennis you know if someone gives you a serve at 90 miles per hour you have to hit it back at 90 if someone lobs it over you can lob it back you know what I mean uh, and so if someone's there I, I don't think it's the time to go all Alex Jones on I think that would be stupid when I'm around like a, a leftist basically like an anti boss thug or gutter punk. I think it's good at that point to be like, you know, you are a disgusting loser, get out of my face. I noticed you did get a lot of media coverage from being there. Oh, absolutely, yeah. Um, and so I think you just need to talk to people, you know, talk to talk to people in different ways. And um, and so, yeah, it was a great talk. Um, I, I hope it's edited honestly, and I think it will be. Um, and so, yeah, that was great. I think that was like Day. Um, I did some podcasts on Wednesday. Uh, we actually at one point went out, in, or twice actually, we went out to the center of Public Square and I, we held up a sign like, what is the alt-right? And I held up a sign that said, want to talk to a racist. <laughs> I did put racist in quotation marks because I know that's not exactly the, uh, that's not at all the word feline. We consider that to be a, a, a stupid, it's a word. To Trotsky, I <laughs> Trotskyist slurs. I think it was, or almost, I uh, might very well be the word. Um, certainly a, a new, but anyway, it's a way to reach people, to be honest. You, all, you sometimes have to reach people where they are, and sometimes you just shock them. Uh, but actually, even when I did that, I, uh, you know, you'll get the occasional anti fashion but you'll actually have some people that I, I talked to the police officer, I talked to some guys, certainly talked to some journalists. Um, and I just basically tried to, you know, do every, talk to every journalist I could. Um, I uh, did interviews for French television, uh, for Taiwan, <laughs> for, uh, for uh, some local stations, and um, yeah, it's uh, it really is about getting out there and um, and delivering our message. And you know, they're they're going to they're going to 
they're, they're obviously not going to like me. But I have noticed this general tendency towards more objectivity. And I more think objectivity? Absolutely. And I think there are a couple of different reasons for that. Um, one of which is that, well, I guess one has two parts to it. Um, one of which is that the just talking about plants and, and cross burnings and lynching and the Holocaust, you know, it just gets old. How many times do you really want to rewrite that argument? Even for these people, it gets a little bit. Uh, I think it's hard, just with who I am, it's difficult to pin that kind of stuff. It doesn't really stick. Um, and the, I think the other reason is that we preach to, I don't know, there's a triangulation, I guess, where a lot of liberals want to talk to us because they probably think, they, and they want to, in a way, overestimate our power because they want to, because we're connected to Trump. And I, I think we should be honest with them. They, they want to kind of, they could say they want to smear Trump. They want to say that Trump is, you know, energizing all of these games. Um, I think that we need, we need to be aware of what that is, but I think we should say that we could reach a certain mutually beneficial arrangement. We want to promote our ideas and the full promote our ideas. Um, I would say this, I've done a ton of interviews with liberal uh, I have not done an interview with conservative journalists. And I've never had a conservative journalist actually talk to me accurately uh, print or reproduce my phone. Um, Conservative journalists basically want to talk about us and claim that we're taking control of my microphone. So I know you d you did get to go to uh, Milo's party. Yeah, that was fun. Uh, it was the uh, party of the convention, definitely. <laughs> it was the one everyone was talking about, and uh, it was an interesting event because it was filled with uh, shitlords so to speak. Uh, I shouldn't say Phil, uh, but many were there. Um, and Could you well, name names? Was, or <laughs> well, uh, who who have been the names of people who have announced themselves? Uh, like Cernovich was there, some others. Um, a lot of, I don't want to name someone's name who has kept it a secret, so I don't fully know the information. I would imagine he announced it, but... Um, uh, a lot of us there. The Brimelos were there. That, that was announced on, on media. Um, so it was it was great. And then there were lots of other people who were very sympathetic there. Uh, so it was great. I just think the right is clearly changing. Um, the you know the conservatives don't get invited to the good party. <laughs> um, but but also it's just uh, I I don't think we as the alt-right would have ever gone to the convention in the first place before Trump. But uh, there was a considerable alt-right alt -right presence at the RNC this year, though, right? Absolutely, yeah. I don't. Did anyone go in 2012 of any note? I mean, I, I don't think anyone expressed interest. No one, no one is motivated to go back Romney. I mean, if we went, we would probably go to criticize Romney. <laughs> <laughs> and so... You know, I would almost rather go to the DNC. It'd be kind of more more interesting. It's a freak show. <laughs> Didn't you say you were interested in writing an article like early next year called like an appreciation of Barack Obama? Yeah, you know, I've said that before. Um, you know, I Barack Obama. Barack Obama is a, an extremely ambiguous figure, and he actually has not. I mean, if you just judge him on being like. Is this man a fairly conservative president? He's not as bad as George W. Bush. I, I just have to. I can only reach that conclusion, particularly he's in the like, realm uh, where the president has like the most Bush power to foreign policy. He's like Bush Light. He has, you know, because keep this in mind: the president does not legislate. I mean, the president is an executive, uh, and so he he has less power in domestic affairs. In foreign policy, he is a dictator. I don't think that, I don't support Barack Obama's foreign policy in the sense that I, I endorse it or I like, a lot of things he's done have been bad. I mean, um, the uh, uh, Libya being a prime example, we've created a, 
a failed state. That being said, um, you know, I have to hand it to him. Uh, I, I think if John McCain had been elected in 2008, uh, we might very well be at war with Russia right now. In a nuclear and, holocaust. <laughs> yes, I, I kind of mean that seriously, that we would not be having this conversation. We'd be scurrying around in the uh, wreckage that once was uh, New York for City. Uh, food. We yeah, had roasting grass over matches. <laughs> yeah. Did you get a chance to uh, watch uh, Trump's speech at the convention? Oh yeah, I would. I would not have missed that for for the world, and um, I wouldn't have missed Peter Thiel's speech as well. I was very. Oh, that was that. that was great. Yeah, and again, I I don't. I mean, if we want to go like morph into talking about ideology and and the conservatives, I mean, look, I think that the Republican Party is being transformed. And so I think that Bill Crystal and a lot of the Cuck, George Will, National Review, I think they are right to be this freaked out by what just happened. Uh, because their party, the party they like, their principles, their values, it really is changing. Conservatism now, is this, Yeah, conservatism is Now, whether this will stick, I don't know. I obviously hope it will. But just keep this in mind. I mean, the... You had Peter Thiel really, like, he, he, the, I thought the line of the convention, he said, you know, we could have gone to Mars and instead we invaded Iraq. So yeah, he basically, yeah. not only is that a kind of, you know, futurist, uh, you know, Faustian inspirational line, but it, it also it is a total rejection of the mainstream conservative and, and Republican foreign policy uh, of, of the last administration. And so it, it, that is really major. Um, Trump wasn't as specific. He would often associate bad foreign policy with Hillary. But if you actually look at what he's saying, he's basically saying the neoconservatism uh, and Bush foreign policy has been an utter failure, and it is over. It's not happening. I'm not hiring any of those people. We're going to have a totally new way of doing things. Um, also, I mean, look, if you want to if you want to ask, like, what is what is Trump really saying? He's saying, I know the system's rigged. I'm a member of the system. I am going to create a new order that might have a great deal of what conservatives would label socialism in it in order to stick up for you. And whether he could do that as president, whether, you know, Paul Ryan's Congress is going to go along with this, whether any president could do that remains to be seen. But just the fact that he's opening up uh, these ideas, he's, he's bringing these ideas to the conservatives and he's getting applause, is really major. Uh, I mean, just little things like Ivanka talking about, uh, she was vague, but she apparently was talking about federal paid leave for women who are in corporations and business, small business even, I would, I would imagine, I don't know, to, to, have, to take off a year or two to, for child rearing. I mean, that... Sponsored eugenics. Oy. The context <laughs> of Ivanka's speech is what's kind of ironic is that she kind of started things off about talking about how she wants to empower women, and at first it's the kind of speech like you would expect a feminist to want to hear. But then she went on yeah. and she said something really fascinating. She said that the idea that, of, of the, the idea that women don't get paid as much as men is a myth, because she said yeah. single women make as much, if not more, than men. But she said the, the key issue is that uh, is married women and mothers. Obviously, I mean, and, and it's and it's uh, we know that it's deeper than that. I mean, men and women have fundamentally different personalities. Um, uh, men are going to be much more interested in aggressively climbing the corporate ladder. They're much more interested in working seven days a week, you know, uh, nine until nine. Uh, women are less interested. A lot of that has to do with the fact that they're going to take off, if they're going to have a child, just because of their biological nature, they're going to take off serious points, serious time for points in their lives. And, uh, but I think it's beyond that. I think our brains are totally different. But, uh, yeah, just the fact that she basically said that, you know, if you, if you actually look at men and women's pay and you adjust, um, and you, and you adjust in for marriage and things like that, there is no pay gap. And basically, uh, and then her conclusion, which is brilliant, which is that we could 
we could actually allow more women to take off time through some kind of federal program, I would imagine. I mean, it's, she was vague about it. Uh, just the fact that someone said that, it was a major thing. Um, you know, it's, it's kind of interesting how uh, Donald Trump also, you know, with the gay stuff, um, I, I, a lot of people before the speech came out, like Ross Douthat and, and Rod Breyer, they said they both said the same thing. They said this is Buchananite without the uh, without Christianity. Well, I mean, I, I guess without like the Catholicism. Yeah, um, that reminds us of kind of our remember our first show we talked about conservative conservatism and yeah. radical centrism, and basically that's basically what radical centrism is. It's like uh, Buchanan, Buchananism, but without the social conservative element. Buchanan and Ralph Nader, whatever the middle point between the yeah, like a guys cross is. between Happy yeah, Buchanan and I Ralph think... Nader. And I also see that on economics, uh, Trump is talking about bringing back the Glass Steagall Act, and that's really, I think, he has a potential to appeal oh, to Bernie Sanders supporters yeah, because I saw yeah. Hillary. Clinton, by choosing Tim Kaine, basically gave the middle finger to all of Bernie's supporters. I saw all these liberals online. They were just freaking out that Donald Trump <laughs> was talking about Glass-Steagall and <laughs> Hillary's not going to do yeah. it. It almost seems like Donald Trump has taken the Bernie platform and thrown it onto his nationalism. Yeah, exactly. But, but wait, the Tim Kaine speaks Spanish. Does not change. <laughs> I mean, yeah. I mean, it, it is like that. You know, I, I, I was actually thinking about this. I, I might I want to write, add this to something that I write about Trump. But, you know, Trump's a builder. And I think that's a kind of interesting and revealing aspect about him. And granted, he's done tons of other things. He's done TV, he's done branding, he's done wine or whatever. But, you know, he's de he defined himself as a builder. And I, I, that, that's interesting. He didn't define himself in high finance. And he didn't define himself in, in the corporate sphere. He defined himself basically like here. And, and even he certainly built things outside of America. But he was basically like, this is ours. This is, this is real estate. This, this is, uh, you know, this, this is here, right here. We're, we're going to have to hire local people. We're going to have to deal with them. We want the best people, so we're going to have to treat people with respect. We're going to make something really beautiful that you're proud of. I mean, you could say Trump's gaudy, but the fact is, if you actually look at Trump Tower, his first major project, the Commodore Hotel, I mean, he clearly wanted, he didn't want to just make a bunch of money. He clearly wanted to create something that was really impressive and that people are proud of. And I, I think that's just similar to his nationalism. You know, he, it, it's, it's not about these universal principles like the cost. It's, it's not about America as this global financial power. It's, it's this let's make America great again. Let's build this beautiful country. It's about having a sort of grand vision for the country as opposed to just saying the concept of a proposition nation that, that this yeah. nation is great because we have these uh, ideologies like uh, free market capitalism. Well, Peter Thiel, he wrote that article in, I think it was 2012, where he said, like, getting a man on the moon is progress. Having a black president really isn't progress. <laughs> like, I think the left, and the left goes forward in this idea of, like, social progress, whereas this sort of new right is about, like, technological progress, civilizational progress. Right. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I couldn't put it better than that. Uh, I mean, I, 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 I've said this a couple times recently. I, I was out on this um, early morning show. <laughs> oh, God. I was, I was actually out here in the mountain time uh, for the summer, and I, I got invited to go on a 7 a.m. show on the East Coast. I was like, oh, God, I'm going to have to get up at 4. Anyway, I went on uh, Roland Martin. And, uh, but anyway, I, I was talking to him, and he's like, you've got to share. You've got, you, you, we're all here. You've got to change. And I'm like, look. Sharing is for losers. <laughs> like, we want to go to space. You know, I mean, I, 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 and I said that to Jorge Ramos as well. Like, I, I don't, you know, this, is, this isn't what, we're on this earth for such a short period of time. The idea that we would dedicate our civilization towards bringing about equality, worldwide equality among the races. I mean, what are we doing? I mean, I, I just, we, we I don't know. I mean, I, I guess this maybe even expresses a little bit of my uh, atheism, or you could say my fear of death, uh, where I am only going to be here for not very much longer. 
And the idea that this is our goal that we put for ourselves is just morally appalling. Our, our goal is really to leave a mark and to, 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 to achieve something that other earlier people dreamed about and that our, 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 our um, great-grandchildren are going to admire us for. Well, and they don't, that's yeah, the only yeah. thing that should matter. Well, we're like individualistic and have that kind of like, like I want Dune to be real, you know, and, and other people, exactly. like, you know, they, they, just, they don't have the same civilizational goals and that's fine. That's fine that they're the way they are, but we sort of have to meet. We should be allowed to be the way we are. I think on exactly. our well, on our last show, we one of our last shows, we declared that uh, Trump, as a retro futurist uh, vaporwave icon. <laughs> yes. Well, I mean, I I think I I did say this in my in my speech uh, a couple months ago at, at MPI. I was, kind of talking about how I think it's fascinating how we project onto Trump our, our hopes and dreams. That's what that Scott Adams mean said. That he's, yeah. Trump is yes, whoever Scott we Adams want him to be. And, and I, right, he's, you know, I am whatever Gotham needs to be. <laughs> <laughs> Since That's he true. is kind of like Pepe the Frog because Pepe <laughs> is whatever, is like the shape of the Mutable force. Can be, yeah, it's this mutable force. He can be anything you want him to be. Yeah, and I think there's something great about that. There's something beautiful about that. And I don't think Ro- Mitt Romney can't be that. You know, Mitt, Mitt Romney, at the end of the day, is, it's not like he's a bad person. He, he's clearly not, and he's clearly a very talented businessman. Uh, but at, at the end of the day, he's just some Mormon rich guy. Like, there's nothing to him. He doesn't have any dreams outside of making another 2% on his profit margin and There's nothing you know, Nietzschean having about a big vacation house. Yes, I mean, again, this guy is a Mormon businessman. I can't express how, like, limiting that is. Trump, he has this, even if he is vulgar, and he is, you know, believe me, I get that. But it's just, his personality just expresses this, like, reaching for greatness. And, and breaking the status quo, too. I mean, I feel like so many people, they just want to maintain the status quo on the current right and current left. All Their, their goal is just to maintain the status quo, and when we talk about things that are outside of it, it scares the shit out of them. Yeah, I mean, for us, politics is, is, a, is an art, you know, in a way. We, it, it's not just about, you know, when you talk to Matthew Iglesias, I've never talked to him, but when you listen to like Matthew Iglesias and Ezra Klein argue about these things, they're, they're, it's like, oh, I, I have this new policy paper, and oh, you see this new staff, so I it. And it, it's just like, these people are very smart, but it, it's just so limited and just so like soul sucking. It's just awful. And for us, and I think that's kind of a, a expresses the all right. Like for, for us, politics is art. It, it's like it, it really, it really is about greatness, and that's what Donald Trump's all about. I'll just mention one one quick thing. I, I was I, I've been reading uh, the Art of the Deal uh, recently, and it's a very revealing book. He, he talked about his father um, being a, a really great businessman, to be sure. But being kind of maybe a little bit more like Romney, like he a, a little bit more of the kind of uh, uh, you know down to earth, you know uh, arrive on time, leave on time, stay under budget kind of builder, and that, that's great and to be admired. But his mother had that kind of flamboyant flair, like she would she would she loved the, she was Scottish and she would love the royal she loved the royal family. And, she would, you know, uh, he, he described something of like watching the coronation or, or something, and she was glued to the television watching. She had that kind of sense of pomp. And, and Donald Trump is, is, is kind of like a synthesis of those two things. He, he is a businessman, but he, he, he has that sense of, of pomp and, and, and beauty and, and flair and flamboyant. God Emperor Trump. Exactly, yeah. I want to talk about uh, Trump's selection as uh, Mike Pence as a VP. I know we were kind of mm-hmm. talking about the direction of Trump and how ideally uh, Trump should go in a more like radical centrist direction. What I'd ideally like to see the direction of the Republican Party is put a strong emphasis on things like national sovereignty, but on mm-hmm. economic issues and the sort of token social issues. 
uh, going in more like centrist direction. And I, you could even make a comparison, like someone like Marine Le Pen in France has even gone in that direction. And mm. Conservative Inc., their key issues are uh, social issues like abortion, uh, anti-homosexual marriage, and uh, low taxes for the rich. And a lot of these, cons and uh, Mike Pence is basically the candidate of Conservative Inc. So I think ideally Trump should have picked someone like Jim Webb, or even like yeah. even Michael Flynn would have been acceptable. But I kind of understand. Well, Flynn was on the list, but Webb was never. I think I think the three of us probably would all want Webb. I don't know. But a, yeah, speaking for you guys, but. yeah, I like Webb just because it would be so outside the box. Like it, it struck me as a, something Trump might do because it would shock people and they'd, they'd kind of be like, oh, wait, what's going on here? This guy, he was a Democrat. Wait, you know, I think that struck me as something Trump might do. Um, I, I, I've also, I mean, and, and other people, I think Ann Coulter might have said this too. She might have started it. But oh, I thought you said Ann Coulter would be his VP. <laughs> yeah, well, and that would have been, nah, that was not a good idea there. I mean, she's a little, <laughs> no, no. <laughs> I mean, she, I, was, I saw someone I would on like Twitter said a, he wanted Jared Taylor to be <laughs> Trump's <laughs> VP. <laughs> which, <laughs> that would have been outside the box. I, that would that would have been actually maybe even better than Ann Coulter. That would have been so outside the box. But um, Ann Coulter a little little too edgy, uh, you know, a little too prickly. I, I don't. Um, I think she would not be good. I think Jim Webb, Scott Brown, like I, he's just you know he's on his first marriage. He is very good looking and just seems normal and healthy. Uh, uh, he also is very good on immigration. And but then is from the Northeast, so he kind of has. Some more centrist positions than other things. Yeah, uh, and Scott, you know, who I think Scott Brown is someone. Scott Brown is someone who, on one hand, he's acceptable to mainline Republicans, but he can also appeal to a lot of the independents that Trump needs to win. Exactly. That, that's what I was thinking. Now, granted, he's lost two elections, so you know, I think people might see that. Oh, he's he's got him burned twice, he's a loser. I think that's a bit unfair, but I, uh, I would have liked that. I was, for the, the weekend uh, that he picked uh, Mike Pence, I was basically uh, in a very bad mood. Uh, I just felt like we had just defeated these guys, like the conservatives and the religious right and the GOP establishment, and then Trump picked their generic candidates. And it was pretty depressing. Uh, I would say that I don't think Pence is this great pick. I mean, I understand the arguments for him. Or, He's not Newt Gingrich either. Right. That would have been truly uh, awful. But he's not Newt Gingrich. He's clearly just kind of weak and limited. He's not very sharp. Um, I don't. He's obviously not a dumb person, but he's not, you know, would, could you imagine having a stimulating conversation with Mike Pence? No. Uh, so, you know, he, he picked him. I, 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 I can get the argument. I mean, fine. Uh, I don't think it's going to help Trump at all, and I don't think it really signifies anything great. It might just simply signify that there are a lot of mainline Republicans, and they're going to be a part of this. And if that's what he has to do, fine. I still don't agree with it. Uh, however, I would say this. I was greatly uh, lifted, my spirits were lifted with Mike Pence's speech because uh, he didn't, he, he, he went, he got on board. And, you know, Mike Pence is kind of like a football coach. You know, he's, he's on the team. And this is where the, te this is what the team is doing this year. And he's going to go with it. <laughs> so, yeah, that's, yeah. you know, I, I don't, I, I felt better about it. I don't think it's great. I don't think it's a disaster either. I was kind of worried that it was going to be a disaster, but the whole like the whole thrust of the convention was we are not the religious right. We are this is a new nationalist populist movement, and Pence was 100% on board with it. And so, you know, I'm I'm okay with it now. Well, the thing is, conservatives though is that they sort of just listen to their leaders, and if Donald Trump is this guy's leader. He'll just listen to him, you know. <laughs> like, exactly. you, know you have sheep and wolves, and <laughs> the, just the sheep are going to follow whoever, <laughs> wherever, whatever direction the wolf is going to go in. So, right. We touched upon this briefly, but how much success do you think uh, Trump and the alt right in general could have in bringing in a lot of the Bernie supporters? 
because now, as I said, Hillary basically gave them the middle finger by choosing uh, Tim Kaine, and Tim Kaine is like the he was like Wall Street's uh, favorite candidate. I th I think there is a real potential. I I was actually just listening to uh, a, a podcast with Nate Silver. And Nate Silver, of course, was very wrong about Trump, but uh, he he's also is good at what he does generally, uh, which is you know number crunching and polls and all that kind of stuff. Uh, he was saying that the the Bernie the Bernie Bernie supporters for Trump was not a real significant phenomenon. Uh, but, you know, that was pre Kane. That was pre DNC leaks. Uh, you know, I don't know. I, I, I think there's a real chance for that. And this, I think this is clearly going to be a close election. And I think that, you know, I think there's a real chance for it. Um, if, 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 these, if these supporters really believe this is what Trump is about, and if Trump kind of sticks with this radical centrist message, and doesn't just, you know, bow to the conservatives on policy. And I don't think he is. I, I think after this convention, he's not. And he talked about tax cuts for a little bit, but oh, that, that was yes. like a brief forgettable moment. He, he I mean, was about I was nationalism. Uh, to Robert Reich on Bill Maher bash Trump, but he did uh -huh. have a valid point about one, about one issue. Trump's tax plan has a massive uh, tax cut for the ultra-wealthy, and that would be a disaster mm. that would further increase our deficit. So I really hope Trump doesn't go through with that. But overall, I think overall he's heading in the right direction. And I, I'm glad. I, I have heard that there is this progressive uh, revolt against Kane. I'm not plugged into that world on Twitter or any, anything else. So I don't know how real it is. Um, but... I think it'd be interesting. I think this is the Kane pick is very surprising because I, you know, I did a podcast with uh, Jazz Hands McField uh, on Wednesday night, and, and and I was also talking with some of my friends, some of whom are, are really plugged into this stuff more than I am. And everyone is actually the same mind. We were like, he, she's not going. Hillary is not going to pick um, Bill Sack or Tim Kane. Those are just boring middle-aged white guys. She's going to have to go brown or go home. And so it's going to be like Cory Booker, might even be the, one of the, the Castro twins. It's going to be someone out of left field. But, but I, don't, I can't imagine that, I couldn't imagine at the time, that you would have the election of Barack Obama and then we'd be like, all right, we're going back. We're going to have, middle, we're going to have baby boomer white guys, you know, and, and a grandma running for a president. I mean, she wouldn't do that. Well, so Trump actually wrote that uh, Tim King, he said uh, he's a moderate on trade issues and abortion rights, and was well, he said that uh, Tim King is basically the opposite to be pro -life. of what Bernie Sanders uh, supports, for what Bernie stands for. So he, Trump yeah. actually is trying to reach out to his supporters. Oh, That's and then awesome. Trump pointed out um, Trump pointed out that uh, he supported the Trans-Pacific uh, Partnership deal. He did, but uh, so uh, did so uh, Pence. Basically, Kane's kind of bad on everything. He he he's a he used to be a pro lifer. He's very pro immigration. I just saw this um, this video of him speaking Spanish to Catholic to he's talking about how he's a Catholic and he love you know he, he used to live in you know Guadalajara when he was a kid and blah blah blah. Just truly awful. Um, and then but then he's basically a globalist on free trade, which of course you know in a way rhymes with being pro immigration. Uh, yeah, he's just truly awful, and then he's just so catastrophically boring. He's just such a dipshit. I mean, there's no other way to just, you just look at him. He looks like a conservative, like what we would <laughs> imagine as like a, you know, middle-aged goober, uh, but he's actually a Democrat. Anyway, a lot of the Democrats uh, are just are conservatives. So, you know. <laughs> I want to move on to some other topics, but is there anything yeah. else you'd like to add about the GOP conventions and your experiences there? Well, one, one real quick thing. Um, I've talked a lot about my experiences. One real quick thing. Um, I, I, I wonder if this is happening. Um, I wonder if there's going to either be a, a major fragmentation or there might even be like a, a secession where the, the Cruz, Cruz, Ted Cruz's refusal to endorse Donald Trump was really significant. And let's not forget that a lot of people have denounced him for that, and he there there are reports that he was expelled from a party hosted by Sheldon Adelson. 
Because remember, Sheldon Adelson, everyone knows he's a huge, he's a huge GOP donor. He's a casino magnet. A, uh, uh, he's Jewish. He's a, also a, a serious Zionist. Remember, Sheldon Adelson does not strike me as ideological or even like inherently pro-immigration. I mean, he strikes me, he, Israel is the most important thing in his life. And he does not trust the Democrats. Uh, so take that for what it is. Um, and but the fact is, you know, you're disloyal to the party, and Sheldon kicks Ted Cruz out of the uh, out of his his party, his, his own cocktail party. I thought that was significant, and I just wonder if we're going to have a fragmentation where there really is like a cup wing of the GOP, the renegade the party. <laughs> yeah, the renegade party, right? And then there's the uh, the national and populist wing, and a lot of the religious right people. Or maybe a little bit torn. You know, they're used to all the cup language, but you know, a lot of those people, their hearts are with a winning, and b, their hearts are with popular. And so, Trump actually won like all those Bible ba- uh, Bible Belt states in the South. He did. He won those states. It, keep this in mind, though. He had more intense support in the Northeast. So, like Massachusetts counties were like one hundred percent for Trump. <laughs> and, you know, but he did win. The, he, he he obviously won South Carolina. That was huge. I don't think he would have won the nomination without doing that. And then he, you know, Mississippi, all those places. And it was actually in the Midwest and and then the some of the Mountain West, like Utah in particular. That's probably why he chose uh, Pence because Pence has a strong appeal to like Midwestern Christians. Yes, absolutely. Um. That, that it makes look. I see it. Um, you know, let's see what happens. But uh, that, that is kind of country. Um, I mean, I would say particularly Utah seems to strike me as just these, just a land of truly deluded white people. It's a Mormon <laughs> ethno state, though. That's what's <laughs> <laughs> well, strange about it. That. Well, I mean, but it's not. I mean, like a county in Massachusetts has a better idea of what's happening in the world than someone living out in a, you know, suburb of Colorado Springs or, or you know, the, again, Colorado delegation also did a coup. So I, I think we're, we are having this, like, goofball revolution, like, a, within our race, all these people who, like, literally believe in their principles. And, uh, and this seems to be highly correlated with religiosity, um, except in the South. Um, that, that is a, but, but remember, even the South is not as intensely first off as the, as uh, the Northeast. Uh, anyway, we'll just see how it goes. But if 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 we do have a divisive party, I'm for division. I, I think that we should really make distinctions between the Ted Cruz people and people who are populist and nationalist. So I think it's exactly. great. I'm and glad that Cruz did that. Potential to pick up some segments of the Democratic Party, so it wouldn't necessarily lead to a smaller party. Yeah. It, it, it is going to be the white party. And, and, you know, that's what I joked. I mean, I, I often like feel like I agree more with liberals or the Democrats more on more issues than I agree with the Republicans. But the fact is, these, these parties are becoming racialized. And, you know, the Republicans have driven me crazy. <laughs> I think they've driven most of us crazy for a long time. But they are the white people's party. And, you know, it, I, I just don't think the alt-right could ever have a place in the Democrats as they are now. I mean, that, I'm not saying I would be religiously opposed to that, but I just don't see it. And, you know, we're going to, you know, we're going to have to be a part of the, the, the white people's party if we're going to have <sighs> anything to do with politics. Have you heard of the alt-left as an alternative to the alt-right? <laughs> Well, is that, is there an alt, I, I mean, I, I've seen it on Twitter, and uh, I don't know, would you say that Bernie is the alt-left? Our friend Rabbit has a website called altleft.com, and oh, then there's also Robert Lindsay. Yeah. yeah, so there's a couple I, guys who are kind of dissident leftists that are, but they're, uh, like, they just so are anti-right, like, sort of. <laughs> yeah, well, it's almost like HBD-aware uh welfare statist or something like that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think that's great. Um, but they might even have more of a place in the GOP. I mean, if we <laughs> accomplish this, if, if we do a reset and we're back at 
having nominees like Romney or McCain or George W. Bush, not only will I be depressed, but I, I don't think we should, you know, we're not going to be going to the conventions and having a, a voice. I think if Trump really does change everything, then, you know, maybe the, the, we'll have a little alt-left division, you know, in, in the GOP. That, that would be pretty fascinating. So I want to talk a little bit about what's going on in Europe. To start things off, mm -hmm. uh, Richard, you were recently banned from the UK, and then you got, uh, not only were you banned, you got a special, like, a James Bond style a letter from <laughs> I think it had like the signature of the queen or the stamp of the queen how long yeah, was that like, where you like thought you were you know getting the letter from M in your mind like was it 10 seconds well, I feel about that yeah I mean yeah, like, yeah. obviously uh, we all have our own little childish uh, fantasies in our minds but yeah I, I did get this special delivery and then I, I saw this envelope that said on her Britannic Majesty's service and I was like oh wow this this is great. Like I'm, you know, who knows what's happening? You know, a special mission, or I've invited <laughs> something. And then I, I read the first couple sentences, and I was like, oh, great! I can uh, travel to Britain now. <laughs> but what's but, ironic about this is you're banned from most of Europe, but you're actually not banned from like you're not banned from Turkey. You're not banned from Algeria. Uh, no, I could go to Algeria. I could go to Turkey, uh, and I can go to Eastern Europe. Uh, it's the Schengen Well, zone, you're banned from which, Poland. You can't go to Poland. You can't go to Croatia, sure. Romania, Estonia. I cannot go to those places uh, for the moment. The good news is that my Schengen... It, there's a thing called the Schengen Zone, which uh, your listeners probably heard about. It's uh, basically a zone of passportless travel um, in in Europe. And it, it's, it's part of the European Union, you know, to, uh, I don't even know what it, it's a pass, it's a travel zone, actually. And um, so, when you're in the zone, you can just hop on a train or a, or a plane or an automobile and not show a passport. So you could travel from Italy to Germany and Switzerland, which is not in the European Union, is in the Schengen zone, actually. Um, and Britain is not, I believe. So after the, or I, I know it's not, but after the um, the conference in 2014 where I challenged Victor Orban. You know, we, I was banned. We we went there anyway. I was I, I was given a three year ban from the Schengen zone, so I cannot go anywhere there, and that includes twenty six countries. Um, the UK ban, which was I should mention, was delivered by uh, Theresa May, uh, who was then the Home Secretary and is now the Prime Minister. Uh, this is actually an indefinite ban. I mean, I am, I you know, they're going to have to make a fundamentally new decision for me not to, uh, to for me to ever be allowed to go to London or, or, or the United Kingdom that includes the airport so uh, it is actually uh, quite distressing and it's going to be very inconvenient uh, and, and it's just uh, you know it, it's totally insane um, you know I'm not uh, I, I'm not the one uh, <laughs> engaging in mass shootings I'm not the one you know, prepping young girls in Rockford. You know, I'm, I'm not the one, uh, uh, you know, leading to greater crime in London, uh, yet they're banning me. It's just, it's, it's, it's truly appalling. Um, but, you know, again, I, I, I think I will be able to go to Western Europe and Central Europe pretty soon uh, in the fall of next year. Uh, but, yeah, it's, it's pretty uh, pretty amazing. You know, I can, uh, I'm going to have to, all my travel will be, uh, <laughs> will be to uh, Asia, I guess, <laughs> or Africa. That's yeah. That that is, so it, it's you know it, it, you see all this stuff happening where they're cracking down on us. Like I was, I had a travel ban minutes before, literally minutes before my party. He was banned from Twitter. This is a guy who had at, at its at its at his height uh, three hundred thousand followers. So that he was a huge force, and he was actually a force that was probably going to affect the election. In a, in a small way, you know, someone like Milo. Uh, the, the youth vote, from probably. The what? The youth vote, I would say. Yeah, sort the of the youth vote. I mean, hipster, young kid subculture, Milo kind of, you know, saying, oh, well, all those SJW types are stiffs. Come have fun with me. <laughs> you know. Exactly. That is, that is actually major. 
I mean, that that could that can, you know, it's it's, it's on the margin, but that that could affect the election. And so he's banned. I'm banned from these countries. Um, there there are other people. You know, Charles Johnson has been banned from Twitter for a while. Uh, it, we're in a dangerous situation uh, where we're being cracked down upon, and it's not systematic. It's not universal. You know, it's 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 not like every shitlord has just been kicked off Twitter overnight. You know, it's all very it's all done in individual cases. But the trend is clear. Um, so again, I don't know how we're going to handle this ultimately, but it's something that we definitely need to think about. Uh, because yeah, they, they, are they leave ISIS up there, but then they, you know, and also you know, the Black Lives, yeah. you know, there is the Dallas shooting and all these, you know, these uh, the Louisiana shooting. These things are directly attached to uh, you know Black Lives Matter, and you know Jack Dorsey is still actively promoting you know them, and I don't. There really yeah. hasn't been any violence connected to people espousing you know nationalistic views, uh, at least not not on that level. So it's kind of it's no. a little bit, you know, there's a stupid double standard, and I don't really, I think it will negatively affect these social media platforms in the long long run, though. People are more I alert. Think it will be because Milo makes Twitter cool, and we do in our in our own smaller way. I mean, Milo is Milo still is a star. I mean, he's you know he, he's he's bigger than than the alt right is certainly. I want to comment on the situation with Europe in regards to terrorism. And it seems to be, so we had the big terrorist attack in Nice, and then we had that uh, a guy on the train in Germany uh, hacking people. And this seems to be Ooh. happening on a regular There was a shooting basis. yesterday. Yeah, there was. Yeah, I didn't want to talk about One that. in Germany. It's terrifying. But it used to be that terrorist attacks were these, like, shocking events. But now it's gotten to the point where they're, like, a common occurrence. Yes. That that is that is a, a huge change, and we've become inured to them. Uh, it, it, it's it, it is. I don't even know where to go. Are, are we going to have a terrorist attack every week from here on out? God, a serious question. Yeah, it's like we're in a children of men. It's like we've reached children of men. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's horrible. We have reached kind of children of men where ev everyone is. You know, just walking around, not thinking about it, going about their lives, where while you know a convenience store is blown up and a and a you know some guy shoots up a bus and there's some terrifying thing about rape on New Year's Eve and we just kind of you know stare down at our feet. Uh, we are reaching that kind of that situation. That's where we are. This recent shooting is really bizarre because well, my initial response to this was. Uh, I was expecting the guy to be a migrant and a supporter of ISIS, but mm -hmm. doing some research on the shooter, he's of a Iranian origin, and it turns out the media is saying he was bullied by a Turkish and Albanian Muslims in high school, and he wanted revenge against them. And then they're trying, the media is trying to spin it and saying that he admired Anders Breivik and did it on the five-year anniversary. So they're trying to paint him as like a right-wing extremist. But he doesn't fit neatly into any kind of a left-wing or right-wing narrative. Uh, he, I mean, his no, victims were of all backgrounds, but I think he did target a McDonald's that... He targeted a bunch of like a Turkish uh, teenagers at the McDonald's. But mm. he doesn't really fit into the sort of... Uh, He's not like your typical uh, jihadi, like the terrorist in Nice. He, he, in, in a sense, I think he has more in common with a lot of a lot of these uh, American uh, uh, mass shooters, like a uh, Dylan Roof and a uh, James Holmes. Mm. Interesting. Uh, well, and he's and an outlier. Kind of, you know, there's a million other guys that have committed terrorist attacks. You know, so. Yeah. Well, I think it, it's still fits into that trend that there, there's something going on with with social mood and 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 people copying you know behavior like that the mass shooting has become a, a thing it's become a a way of expressing something uh, sometimes it might be very, it might be personal or, or or something like that or sometimes it becomes a way of expressing yourself politically um, you know, Omar Mateen was a loser, and then he declared himself as part of ISIS, and he became a political actor. Uh, so, you know, it's it, it is just it's a it's a major trend. 
And, you know, even if this guy is a bit of an outlier, there, there's still something going on uh, with society. I mean, this just, this is, this is very, very shocking. Well, Richard, I just had a question sort of outside of the uh, conversation we've been having right now. But I noticed mm-hmm. in your speech, the uh, Napoleon of the current year, mm-hmm. uh, you mentioned Baudrillard. And, uh, mm-hmm. me and me and Robert had this uh, podcast uh, I don't know, about a month or two ago where I talked about the idea of the simulation. So, mm. yeah, how, how do you feel about, you know, this, this kind of like simulated reality? Because we all sort of, you know, we're all plugged into uh, social media and we're kind of experiencing all of these events through, I think, Baudrillard's idea of the simulation. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you could say that. Um, yeah, I, I, I think we're in, a, we're in an interesting situation because, you know, television, which, which was the symbolic medium of politics and, and culture and society, is really dying. And that is going, and, and, and what's replacing it is social media. Uh, and so if you're, a, if you're a millennial or if you're my age, um, or, or down, you're, you know, you're not watching the nightly news. Um, you're, not wa- you're not even watching cable news or something like that. I don't, I'll occasionally see cable news, maybe, you know, flickering string at a bar when I'm at a hotel or something like that, or, or online. Uh, I'm certainly not sitting down and watching it. I don't know the last time I've watched the nightly news. I, I don't even know who are the anchors. Uh, Moral cord cutters anyways. So many yeah, millennials. All, just, I don't have cable right. TV myself. Right. Oh no, I don't. Know. And so show, social media is really displacing television as the symbolic way that we uh, that that we understand politics and society. And and this has some interesting things. One thing is that it really means there's a tremendous amount of fragmentation. Um, there there's fragmentation in terms of. Uh, of ideology, the fact that we have alt-right Twitter, and that this is this is what we are doing instead of watching television. There's also just the, fra- the inherent fragmentation to all this, and that we're we're consuming bites, and you know um, we're, we're not we're not sitting down for one you know master narrative given to us by uh, Tom Brokaw or Walter Cronkite. We're we're kind of getting little pieces of it, and and then the whole thing has been fragmented. fragmented. You know, there are three, you know, agents of symbolism, you know, or, or, or masters, gods of symbolism, uh, and now we have 300 million. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, so I, I think we're really entering uh, a, a new stage, and, and I think Trump is part of this. I mean, Trump is, you know, in and, and, and more ways than one. I mean, Trump, Trump did not have just the, the greatest traditional campaign. I mean, he's rightly you know, criticized for not really having a ground game, but he's basically proven that celebrity and his Twitter feed is his ground game. And he's proven how powerful that can be. The fact that he is a celebrity, the fact that he can reach people immediately uh, through Twitter, uh, that, that is truly amazing. And I think we're kind of part of it, you know, as well. Like, I don't I don't know the degree to which we've affected the Trump campaign, and it's something that's very difficult to measure. Trump even retweeted a Pepe meme. Exactly, and you remember the whole sharing you know, of the sheriff star, the star of David. Oh yeah, uh, yes. th- this just freaked everyone out. It was what everyone was talking about, and again, it was just a retweet of an image. Uh, and the fact, just even the would Trump be where he is exactly if we weren't kind of turning him into this god. Because that, that's what we're doing. We're, 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 we're projecting onto him, uh, you know, he's a, a, her- a hero out of Dune, or, or he's, a, like a, he's Napoleon. He, he's, a, he's a great leader from the Austro-Hungarian Empire. He, he's <laughs> like, you know, he's... There's that god-king suit they put him in. I think a lot of people yeah. who think like we do see him like in that gold-plated suit holding the giant sword at the top yeah. of the mat with like Wagner playing behind him. <laughs> yeah, or he's Bane, that is, you know, a terrorist oh, yeah. from the Batman universe, or he's Pepe, who's, who's kind of this, you know, mischievous, <laughs> yeah. smirking, you know, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, you know, game player, his new persona. I listened to your podcast. Uh, you you pleaded ignorance about the origins of Pepe, so uh, you're. I think it should be mandatory that everyone listens to the show that uh, Alex and I did. 
Ah, well, I will go listen to that. You talk about the origins of the Pepe name? Yeah, we, we how, awesome. yeah, basically the history of Pepe and how he has become a figure of dissidence within the simulation and <laughs> and how it's a way to basically overturn the simulation into not it's not it's not going to be the liberal liberal hegemony, it's going to be our simulation. <laughs> I think it's, we I are think the new masters of the universe. Yeah. And also like we seem to we are in our own realm. The other thing is that uh, it's interesting, I, I talked about with some friends of mine, it's almost like we're seeing the birth of new gods uh, after the old ones have died. And I'm not just referring to Yahweh or, or Christianity or Jesus, uh, but, uh, but even re- referring to the, the gods of Americanism or, or the, you know, establishment politics. The Constitution. Or, the Constitution, the Second World War, all these god-like events, they're dying. They're, they're ceasing to be relevant. You can, even, you can even say the Holocaust. Not, not, not so much in terms of the historical fact of the event, but the, the symbolic fact of the event, just the way that it haunted people's minds. Uh, these things are dying. They're withering away. And we're almost seeing these new gods form, form. And, you know, like the gods of the ancient world, these gods have weird histories that are, you know, spurious and fragmented and strange, but they seem to kind of, we project onto them all this meaning, and then they start to take on meaning. And so you have, like, Keck is a god, and, and, and Pepe is, this, is a god. And, 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 and the Trump, Trump as an archaeo-futurist warrior king is a god. And we're kind of, we're almost seeing this, this new, you know, a different religion emerge in, in, in from the ruins of the old world. What do you think about the concept of uh, archaeofuturism or retrofuturism as opposed to b- simply being a reactionary or radical traditionalist? Right. I, I think that is the way to go. And I, I, don't, I don't think, you know, archaeofuturism wasn't invented by Guillaume Fay. I, and I don't say that to take anything away from the man, to my greater respect. Uh, you know, I think all societies have, have been archaeo-futurists in the sense that we, we have, you know, a technological or, or human achievements, but you often do draw upon these larger structures. Um, you know, there, there, there are always these tensions within movement. I mean, there's a, there's a tension within the, you know, the creation of, of Europe that, you, you had a lot of some of the structures of the ancient world, and then you had this new religion, Christianity, that was was becoming the dominant force within it. T- completely ironically, this, this was a this was a religion that, in its origins, was radically anti-Roman, um, and might have even actually been, uh, you know, pro-Jewish uh, in a way. Uh, certainly, radically anti-Roman. Uh, and then you have that adopted as the religion of the state. There's always these tensions between the, the future and past and, and, and between something big and something small. I think that, that's when the society is, is, you know, is, is gaining power. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I think that is how we should be. I've never been a paleo-conservative. I've never thought that we should, you know, turn off Twitter and, and go start up a farm. And, you know, it's just not that there's anything wrong with farming. There's a lot of things that are wonderful about farming. Uh, but it's just, it's, you're kind of, it's like the paleos want to basically find, and, and again, I bet a lot of your listeners don't even know what paleos are because they're so irrelevant at this point. But uh, these kind of older style traditionally conservatives, they, they want to make like a period of time and turn it into an ideology. Oh, like Whether they basically want to freeze like the 1800s and have us live there permanently. Yeah. It's like the 1950s, or we want to go back to that. We want to go back to the Middle Ages, and everything's wonderful. It's, it's turning history into an ideology. And, you know, it's just, that is not going to go anywhere. Um, I don't think we should just be, you know, futurists alone and, you know, embrace, like, you know, uh, humans are truly servants of technology. And, you know, for some you know, we transhumanism or something. Our, Exactly. You know, we want to turn ourselves into a microchip and, you know, go turn into pure electricity or something. I, I don't, I obviously don't think there's, uh, it's not very attractive, uh, to me at least, but I think this notion that we're going to have technology, we're going to be a part of it, we don't want to run away from it. There, there are going to be things about our lives and, and about what we accept in society that are going to change, 
but that these can be structured by things that are very old. Um, and, and so that is what I think is, that's where I think we should be moving. Um, I would, I would say this also in terms of politics. I don't think we should always just be reacting to everything. Um, I think there are a lot of good things about Brexit, um, a lot of good things, but I, I think Brexit itself was a kind of false start. It, 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 if you're reacting against something, you're, you're, you're reacting against a lot of things in the modern world that you don't like, and then you're just claiming that the European Union is to blame for it all. And it's not. Um, you know, as, as I've said, I think the archaeo futurist uh, move would be to say, well, what is the European Union? Uh, maybe there actually are a great deal of historical precedent, whether we're thinking about continental empires or the Roman Empire, and that maybe actually this is the way we should go forward. I think that's a much more radical way of looking at things as opposed to give me back the nationalism from <laughs> Margaret Thatcher's era. You know, it's just, it, it, it's, that, is, that is the ultimate reactionary conservative. And reactionaries of that type do always lose. Um, you know, they're, they're always trying to bring back their childhood. And, you know, we, we need to be thinking about, you know, creating these orders that are, that are going to last a thousand years. We are out of time, so I would like to uh, thank Richard Spencer and Alex von Goldstein for being on the show. It's been a pleasure, guys. Thank, thank you so much. Uh, thanks again, guys. Uh, that's all we have for today's show, so take care, and we'll be back with you next time.